Hello and welcome to Diagnostic Radiography here at the University of Leicester. My name is Lana and I am the programme lead um, and I'm also with my colleague Denise, who you'll meet shortly. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to briefly give you a summary of the course. So the course is a three year full time programme. In that time, you will study six modules per year. You have four academic modules and two clinical placement modules. So over the course of all three years, 50% of your time will be spent on placement in a hospital department learning how to do the job. And in terms of our placements, our placement sites are located across Leicester. So all of the city hospitals and out into the wider county of Leicestershire and Rutland. So you'll never have to travel too far for any of your placement sites. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to my colleague De Denise, who will talk you through being a radiographer. Hello, so my name's Denise um, and I'm a radiographer. I work in Leicester and I'm also going to be one of the lecturers um, at the University of Leicester on the diagnostic radiography course. Um, so I just wanted to go through the actual role of a diagnostic radiographer. What exactly do we do? Um, well, we produce high quality diagnostic um, images and that can be X-rays, CT scans, ultrasound, mammography and MRI. You might have heard of all these things, but we'll learn how to do all of those um, examinations. We also learn how to use radiation very safely and legally. There's lots of legislation around being a radiographer and using radiation to produce images. So as radiographers, we need to know what all that um, legislation is about. We also provide excellent care to our patients um, and we work as part of a multidisciplinary team. So we work alongside doctors, nurses, all throughout the hospital in wards and different departments. So we get around quite a bit over the hospital. Um, so just a bit of history on x-rays. Um, x-rays have been around for a while. This gentleman here is Wilhelm Konrad Rotengen. He discovered x-rays. He was a German physicist working on cathode rays and he accidentally discovered these new rays in 1895. And we've come a long way since there. Um, but essentially these x-rays can penetrate the soft tissue and flesh, but not denser materials. So he noticed that by taking an X-ray of his wife's hand, which you'll see a picture there on the, the right hand side. You can see the bones of his wife's hand along with the ring on her um, wedding finger. So this at the time was termed a major medical miracle and it's still a major diagnostic tool now. We've changed a lot in how we produce these X-rays, but it's still essentially the same physics. So this image here, you, you might be able to recognise this as an X-ray of a chest. Uh, and this just shows those differing densities like Wilhelm found with his wife. He could demonstrate her fingers and her, her ring. Um, it's now changed a little bit in that we look at the denser structures the different way round. They show up white on our X-rays now and the less dense structures show up de um, as a darker image. So you'll see the lungs here looking dark and the more denser structure of the heart looking white. Um, so we'll learn as a radiographer how to interpret these images. We also have to use radiation very safely. Um, like I said earlier, lots of legislation around that. So we have to protect ourselves as radiographers but also the patients, very importantly, and their carers and comforters and other staff and visitors around the department in the X-ray um, rooms as well. So we do those in a number of ways. Um, we ourselves as radiographers don't receive any dose ordinarily, and we wear these monitoring badges um, just to make sure that we are kept as safe as possible. So another part of um, radiation protection um, is protecting our patients from the damaging effects of radiation. You might 
be aware of the um, electromagnetic spectrum and the X-rays are part of that. So they're classed as ionising radiation uh, and they can potentially cause harm to our bodies. So this, the real things that we're protecting our patients and ourselves from um, are increased risk of cancer, mutations to DNA in the, the actual cellular structure, skin reddening and cataracts. These are re real things that are in the um, x-ray department that we really have to work against and make sure that we're keeping everybody as safe as possible. Part of that radiation protection is knowing about the risks versus the benefits of our patients having an x-ray. So as, as radiographers and as part of the course, we're going to learn when we should be taking x-rays and when other examinations are going to be more um, safer and more beneficial for the patient. So we're going to learn what imaging techniques to use. And if we have to use x-rays, then we're going to keep the dose as low as reasonably practicable. And this is the ALARP principle that we'll be instilling all the way through the three years of, of the diagnostic radiography course. And obviously as um, a qualified radiographer when you get into clinical practice. Radiographers also have to know the anatomy um, very well. So we've got 206 bones in the human body and we as radiographers have to be able to name all of those bones um, and know how to x-ray each of them. That probably sounds a little bit daunting, but we go through it very methodically. So this image here, this is just demonstrating the bones of the adult hand and wrist. I always find that really fascinating because just in the hand alone, the hand and wrist alone, we've got 27 bones. We've got 14 finger bones, and they're called phalanges, five hand bones, they're metacarpals, and eight wrist bones, they're the carpal bones. So we as radiographers need to be able to um, name each and every one of those bones and know how to x-ray them. So we're also going to learn how to x-ray them as well. These are the different positions. So if we stick with the hand, we've got three different positions of x-raying a hand. We've got the dorsi plantar. Don't worry about the name at this point. It's just one of the projections that we do. We've got an oblique projection in the middle and we've got a lateral projection on the right there. And, and this is just to demonstrate how the bones look slightly different in their different orientation. So the keen eye of you might very well have seen a fracture here of the fourth metacarpal. Um, so you'll see from the dorsi plantar view to the oblique view, the fracture looks a little bit different. Um, and actually, arguably, you can see it a little more clearly on the oblique view. So that's why we have to learn the different ways of x-raying um, each body part in a different way. So computer tomography, CT imaging, you might have heard of that as well. CT uses the same X-ray technology that I've just been talking about, um, but it, it's just ever so slightly different. The, the way the X-ray tube and the machine obviously looks very differently and it takes the images in a different way. And the way it takes them, it then builds up the picture and produces a 3D image of the anatomy. Um, the X-ray tube itself actually rotates around the patient. You may very well have had a CT scan before. They don't take very long, um, but all the science and tech that's going on in there, it's producing very um, clear images of what's going on inside the body. The only downside of this is that radiation dose is much higher than the plain film X-rays that I was talking about earlier. So this is going to be part of the risk benefit that we have to think about for our patients. Is it better for the patient to have that X-ray or is it better to, to have the um, CT scan um, because the plain film X-ray won't show what we're looking for and we have to um, use a lot more radiation just so we can use better images and get the answer for the patients. So this is just a demonstration of a CT scan. Um, so as radiographers, we're going to learn how to interpret these images. Um, so the, the scan here is just running down the body. It's just gone through the lungs, coming through the abdominal area here, 
And there's various different soft tissue structures. Probably doesn't make a lot of sense to you at the moment. The great white bits are the bones. It's going to run through it again. So imagine the head at, at the top end. It's just now running down the body. These black bits here are the lungs. There's the heart in the middle. The white is the ribs and the vertebra that you can see. This is the liver coming in now and the kidneys. And this is the abdominal content, so the bowels. So if we just take one of those um, images, this is a slice through a CT scan um, just with the, the soft tissue um, anatomy just highlighted here. So as we go through the years, um, the three years of the degree, we're going to learn how to interpret this. It does take time. It's not easy um, and it does take quite a bit of looking at different scans numerous times to try and work out what what's um, what's being demonstrated on each scan. So alongside CT scanning, we also have MRI scanning as well. Um, these don't use radiation, but um, they produce 3D images just like CT scanning. Um, this is a slightly different physics that we're using here. So this is strong magnetic fields and radio waves to produce 3D images of the body. These MRI scanners take a, a, quite a bit longer than CT scans that they normally take between about 30 and 40 minutes, um, depending on which body part you're scanning. And if you've had one before, they're very noisy. Um, they, they're, they're sometimes not very pleasant. It's more like a, a tunnel that you go into. But the images that you get out of them are um, really quite high resolution and really demonstrate some soft tissue organs in much greater detail than CT or X-rays will show. So this is just a, a video of a brain scan. Um, so you'll just see it looks ever so slightly different to a CT scan. The soft tissue images are showing up as a, a, a more whiter image than they were in the, in the previous scans. So regarding career development as radiographers, um, just to give you a bit of an idea of where it can it can go, um, there's lots of different avenues for radiographers to go into. You can specialise into CT and MR if that's your um, interest. You can go into mammography, so breast scanning or ultrasound scanning. You're probably all aware um, of ultrasound scanning. We scan pregnant ladies just to see how they're babies are growing and developing. You can go into advanced practice and consultant practice where instead of just taking the x-ray images, you're also going to be reporting on them and um, getting a diagnosis for the patient. That does require quite a bit of additional study after you've qualified as a radiographer. Um, and paediatric imaging, I've put that there because I, I do that. That's my field in paediatric imaging. It's a really interesting field, um, really separate from um, adults. Um, additional career paths you can go into. There's a list there, forensic. These ones um, just developing, really. We can get images of um, deceased patients and we can get cause of death. So instead of patients, these patients having to go into um, a, an actual autopsy, they can just be um, scanned through a CT scanner um, and if uh, the cause of death can be provided because of the CT scan, they won't need to go through the autopsy, um, which is great and it, that's a, an area that's really developing at the moment. Um, so other additional career plans uh, or sorry, career paths are nuclear medicine, veterinary um, radiography, you can go into research or you can come into the academia as well and help teach the next generation generation of radiographers. It's a really wonderful career with lots of different avenues that you can go into um, and, and I love it. So I would love you to come and join us. So I'm going to hand over to Lana now just to go through how to apply. Thanks, Denise. So once you've applied through UCAS, you'll then be invited to interview. All of our interviews this year are being held online and you'll be interviewed by a panel of a mixture of academic staff, clinical staff and some patients and or students. 
If you are offered a place on our course, all of our offers are dependent on clearance with occupational health. And that's not us looking to say that you're not fit enough to be a radiographer. That's just us making sure that if you do have any additional support that you might need, we can get that in place before you start. And equally, because you're working with the public and vulnerable adults and children, you would have to undergo uh, the disclosure and background check. Uh, what I would say is for any interview for any university, having some experience of an X-ray or radiology department would be a real benefit. So have a look around your local hospitals. Most hospitals now are offering um, open days where you can go along, meet the staff, see the equipment and just get a real feel for what radiography actually is. If you have any questions about your um, current studies, your A-levels, BTECs, uh, the email address there for our admissions team, they can answer any questions you have about whether we accept the courses that you're currently studying. So when you log into UCAS, you need our institution code, which is L34, and then the course code is just up there, is B821, and that's just to make sure that you're applying for the right institution and the right course. So why come and study here at the University of Leicester? So this will be our first delivery of diagnostic radiography. So we've been really fortunate in that we've been able to design and create a really innovative programme that's reflective of current working practices and your teaching will be delivered by a mixture of academic and clinical staff. So all of the academic staff are registered radiographers and the majority of our staff still practice clinically. So not only will you see them in your classroom learning sessions, you'll also see them in your placement blocks. We have spread your assessments throughout the year and we've minimised the number of exams that we've included within the programme. And what we've tried to do is find alternative, authentic assessments where possible instead. So things like a mock interview in your final year so that you're prepared for what your stepping into the workplace interview will look like. Things like designing information sources for patients so that you have a real impact on the service that we deliver. We've also incorporated the use of patients in both your teaching and your feedback. So when you're here with us at the university, patients will come in and teach some of the sessions. The patients are why we all do what we do and the patients are in the best place to tell us what it is that they need from our services. And equally, they'll feed back on whether you make them feel safe and respected whilst you're on placement. In terms of employment, we've also weaved employment skills throughout the curriculum. So all of your years will have a focus on your career and your transferable skill. So right from year one, we'll get you starting to think about what kind of a hospital do you want to work in? Do you want to work in a large inner city hospital? Would you rather work in a smaller local district hospital? Or thinking about if you don't want to stay in radiography, what other skills have you learned along the way that could benefit you across your lifetime? There's also an opportunity for what we call an elective placement, which is where you have the opportunity to source your own placement for three weeks. And basically the rules of that are as long as you can get yourself there, you can go anywhere in the world as long as that department is happy to host and support you. Uh, one of the unique points that we have within our curriculum is that in your final year, there is one module where you can choose which pathway that you follow. So we know that individuals are starting to think about their career by year three. And so what we've done is we've given you a, a little bit of choice so that if you're thinking that you know you want to take your career down a certain path, we've given you the option that you can start to formulate that path within your final year of studies. And here at the university, we also have the careers support office that support you throughout all of your studies. They can help with things like CV writing, interview skills, and they're also available to you beyond graduation as you take those next steps into the workforce. 
Our teaching is supported by technology, so we have dedicated software to help link theory to practice and we have a dedicated academic x-ray room within the local hospital, University Hospital Leicester, so that you can develop your skills, so that you've got hands-on experience without the pressure of having a patient, so that once you are um, in an x-ray room with a patient, you're not worrying about which buttons to press, how to move the equipment. You've mastered all of those skills away from the patients, so that once the patients then come and join you, you can focus on your patient care aspect. All of our students are given an iPad so that all of your learning resources can be accessed at any time. As long as you've got an internet connection, all of the hospital sites have an internet connection so you can always access your learning materials, the library resources, anything that you need whilst you're on placement can be accessed. So this is just a picture of our academic x-ray room. This, as I say, it's located within the local hospital. The reason that we've done that is because we think that that's the best learning environment. Whilst you'll have the safety of being in a room that doesn't have uh, scheduled patients, you will be around other radiographers, there will be patients, and you will be seeing those behaviours, role models, you'll be he uh, hearing and experiencing patient um, experience and expectations and it's just a nice way of making sure that you have that professional identity even whilst you're away from placement in an academic block. So we teach in a variety of ways. Our teaching is via lectures where you'll be in a large group and we will be giving you information. We'll also teach through simulation, so we might be in that academic x-ray room and you might be working in pairs, practicing on each other, how to set up and align for that chest x-ray we were looking at earlier. It might be that you're working together in small groups to produce a patient information source. There's obviously going to be independent study and work with patients. As part of the School of Healthcare, you'll also work alongside other professional groups. So we offer courses in nursing, midwifery, physiotherapy and operating department practitioners. So you'll also uh, have teaching alongside those. And what we've done is we've embedded regular assessment throughout the year and the teaching blocks so that you grow in confidence in terms of the type of questions that we ask, how different types of assessments work, so that once it comes to your kind of assessment that counts towards your degree classification, you're very familiar with the processes and it's just a matter of uh, answering the questions. So what I would say is best of luck to all of you as you embark on your career in radiography. Some top tips for us are be confident. We are absolutely sure that every one of you is going to make a great radiographer if that's what you choose to do. You don't need to convince us of that. Ask lots of questions, go along to a hospital open day, attend university open days and ask all those questions. There's no question that's silly, there's no question that's not been asked before, but make sure that you understand what it is you're get, getting into. As I say, try and attend a hospital open day, it'll give you a real insight into what we actually do. No two days are ever the same in radiography. And what I would say is really understand why you want to be a radiographer. We get lots of people that say they just want to help people and that's great. But why do you want to help them through radiography as opposed to being a nurse or being a paramedic? So when it when you're thinking about your applications and your personal statements, if you can really understand why you want to be a radiographer and get that across to us. So if you've got any questions about the course, then please do feel free to drop me an email and I can answer any questions that you may have. My email address is up on the screen. And similarly, if you've got any admissions specific questions, so whether we accept your course, what your predicted grades mean, any questions like that, do contact our admissions team. They have a huge spreadsheet. I can't keep it all in my head, but our admissions team have a huge spreadsheet and they'll be able to answer any specific questions about whether we accept your course and your predicted grades and things like that. So that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for your time and we will now any answer any questions.
Thank you so much to both of you. I know it sounds a little bit like I'm coming from behind the scenes, um, but I've just been sat behind looking at what questions have come through. And whilst you've really thoroughly covered so many components of the course, um, I just wanted to reiterate to anybody who's attending, please do uh, ask away. This is your opportunity. Whilst we've got Denise and Lana here, please do pop any of those questions into the Q&A function that you'll see at the top of the screen. Pop those in there and um, just in the meantime, I've got a couple that I would like to ask you to give any of our audience um, a little bit of extra context. So um, obviously you've said that this is a, a, the first time we're running the course here at the University of Leicester, um, but I just wondered which are the most popular either entry qualifications or pre-university qualifications that diagnostic radiography students might apply to university with, so whether that's BTECs or A levels, access courses, and what might be some of those subject themes? So we're seeing a complete spectrum of all three of those combinations. We, we, we've got lots of A level students coming through. Uh, our A level requirements are just that you have one science. So don't worry about it having to be three sciences, it's just one science. We accept BTEC courses. Um, in anything that's health related, uh, applied science, sciences, any of those BTEC courses. And we also accept access courses. There's a specific access to radiography course, which obviously if people have done is just amazing. But if not, again, there's access to health, access to health professions, all of those courses we accept. And equally, if you've come to radiography as either a career change or you weren't sure what you wanted to do and you are currently doing a course that we don't accept, we do accept access courses directly from a BTEC course. So we, we wouldn't be concerned that you've done a BTEC and then done an access straight away. We understand that radiography is a small profession and a lot of people don't know what we do. And, you know, making that decision to become a radiographer is tricky. So we do accept any of those things. We're also set up to accept T levels once they get started and students start enrolling on those. Thank you, Lana. I'm sure that's really refreshing for our audience to be able to hear. Um, you talked quite a little bit about, um, between the two of you, about what type of clinical skills are obviously acquired through the course, which is obviously fundamental and subject specific content. Um, but what are the key transferable or soft skills would you say our students acquire through studying the diagnostic radiography course? So what I would say is the key transferable skills that you're going to require are those communication skills. In diagnostic radiography, we work with the entire spectrum of the population. Um, you One patient, as Denise mentioned earlier, could be a paediatric five year old that's fallen over in the playground at school. And then your next patient could be an elderly person who's fallen over in the car park of the supermarket. And we have to be able to have that skill set to be able to engage with every one of those patients throughout our day. You'll also learn incredible time management skills. There's always another patient to be seen and managing your workload, managing your time will be absolutely fundamental to what we do. You'll also learn research skills in year three. You'll have a research module to undertake where we'll cover research methods and the various different approaches that you can take uh, when researching a topic. Um, you'll also um, undertake basic life support training, moving and handling training, basic first aid training. So you'll get lots of skills that we can apply to a variety of situations and professions. Thank you. And I think we've obviously talked there a little bit about post studying or post graduation potentially and thinking about what people might use afterwards but obviously people who are maybe inquiring today are really interested in how do they get onto our course and how can they make the most of an application so I guess something I wanted to ask you is what top tips would you share with those attending today regarding what they should include in their personal statements to increase their chances of getting onto our course. I know you mentioned a bit about encouraging some work experience, but what would you encourage that they include? 
So in terms of your personal statement, we'd really encourage you to talk to us about the work experience. So if you saw a CT scan, tell us that you saw a CT scan and why that then cemented your interest in radiography. Or tell us that you watched an, uh, um, an online work experience and what you took away from that and why that has convinced you that radiography is the path for you. We equally want to know that you understand that radiography is the art of taking those images and getting the best possible image to enable those images to be read and diagnosed by a radiologist. The, we, we know that all the words sound very similar and radiographers, radiology and radiologists and everybody gets very confused. We are the people who take the high quality images for somebody else to read. And so, you know, things like knowing that you're a person that pays particular attention to detail, they're the skills that we want to see in your personal statement. And like I say, if you can tell us that you know you want to be a radiographer and not say a paramedic, because you know you like the challenge of never knowing what the day is going to look like, but you also like the structure of knowing that you will be on the CT scanner that day. You just don't know which patients you're going to get. They're the kind of things that really make a personal statement stand out versus people that just say, I like technology and I want to help people. Thank you for your honesty there. I'm sure there's some real pearls of wisdom for those that are attending today. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask one last question. And so if nothing else comes into the chat for people who might have questions, um, I'm going to then ask if either of you have anything further you obviously want to share with our attendees today. But my last question is, is just in relation to our students getting a bit of a picture of what might a typical week look like for them? And I am going to caveat that with, I know on each maybe the different modules that they choose or the different year groups that they're in, so whether then their first, second or third year, that may differ. But how would you describe to a student what a typical week might look like for them? So a typical week will probably look like lectures uh, and seminars on a Monday, so that we kind of ease you gently into the week um, we'll do some science and technology. So where we learn about how X-rays are produced, what happens when X-rays interact with the cells within our body. So as Denise was talking about earlier, those DNA mutations that are possible. We'll then move on to look at some anatomy and start to understand what anatomy um, looks like from a kind of textbook perspective, and then what anatomy looks like when you're actually looking at it on a radiograph. Um, and then on Tuesdays, we will move on and do kind of those softer transferable skills, so patient care skills. We'll have patients in talking to us about what makes a good experience. We'll have some hands-on practical sessions of basic life support, moving and handling. And then Wednesdays, we only teach in the morning on a Wednesdays. We keep Wednesday afternoons free so that should any student want to participate in sports or society activities, they have Wednesday afternoons free so that they can do that. So Wednesday morning, we tend to do kind of simulation based learning. So working with our software to embed those lessons that we've learned on Monday in terms of the science and production of X-rays and we utilise our systems and software packages so that we really reinforce that learning. And then Thursdays we go back to more anatomy because there's never enough anatomy when you're a radiographer. Um, and then we do a little bit more of those softer skills, this time from a kind of legal perspective. So thinking about consent, thinking about ethics and what what it is and isn't okay to do to patients thinking about data protection and how we handle the information that we get from patients and how we process that data and then fridays we go back to kind of hands-on practical labs learning and practicing how we take those specific x-rays 
thinking back to our anatomy. So once we've learned the anatomy of our hands and wrists, Fridays we might practice how we take an X-ray of a hand and wrist and then some more of that anatomy just to reinforce. So a typical week has lots of different things going on. Wednesday afternoons are always kept free and we try and make sure that teaching, classroom teaching finishes around three o'clock so that there's time for self-directed study before kind of five o'clock. Thank you very much for going over that, Lana. And some, some great news is we've actually had a little bit of a surge of some questions coming through from people who clearly you're saying the right types of things for people to want to know more information about. So just a couple of things I'm, I'm going to answer without, I, I, I guess, asking yourselves is someone's asked about a combination qualification between someone who's doing an A-level and um, the subsidiary diploma for the BTEC and Lana did say earlier that obviously they accept a range of qualifications and whenever at an institution we have a range of qualifications we would always encourage you to send an email to the admissions department so you'll see nicely left on the screen at the moment if you drop an email to them and you send as much information as you can about your qualifications hopefully they'll be able to get back to you um, with regards to that. We've also had another question that's come in about what happens after today's um, presentation, because clearly, you know, people want to make reference to what you've been discussing, thankfully, Denise and Lana. Um, we are emailing out the, the presentations from today, but what we are doing is we'll be making them available on the University of Leicester's YouTube website. So you'll be able to see that. I think they'll be from the new year. So if you keep your eye out in early January, literally a recording of this will be shared um, for you to be able to access. So you can obviously make reference at later stages to some of the stuff that we've kindly heard today from Lana and Denise. Um, I do believe this will be our last question, um, which is, how would you go on to the advanced or consultant position afterwards? So a little bit of future planning. Um, I'll, I'll offer up to Lana or Denise for you to answer that one. Lovely. I'm going to let Denise answer that one. Right, so um, I'm an advanced practitioner, so I studied um, additional postgraduate courses in paediatric imaging very specifically and I've gone into a very specific field in um, imaging and scanning babies' hips and babies' hearts. So it's kind of finding your own very niche area or very specialised area that you do additional studies in. Um, so advanced practice, you do need a master's um, to get accredited as, as an advanced practitioner um, and the same for consultant as well. You would need to be working towards a PhD in those situations. Um, and again, they're very specialised fields. So all of the um, areas that I spoke about earlier um, and more so, you can just go into um, very specific avenues um, and do additional studies, postgraduate studies to build up your knowledge, your skill base um, to go into the advanced practice and then consultant practice after that. Perfect. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, I think on behalf of everyone who's attended, that's been really insightful. Um, you'll see that I've just posted some final context into the chat there um, with regards to where you can look for our remaining sessions for the day. Um, and if you've got any questions further in regards to the course, please do take a note of what Denise and Lana have obviously shared on the screen. Uh, enjoy the rest of our opening evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>